I think we'll go ahead and get started. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. And I just want to mention that we're streaming this live so on Facebook. So hello to everyone who's watching from Facebook right now. We're glad to have you as well. I'm Tracy Ormsby. I'm the publisher of the Adirondack Explorer, a nonprofit media organization covering the issues and the stories about the Adirondack Park through our two websites and our bi-monthly magazine. Uh, we give readers the information they need so that they can get involved and act in their communities and to protect the park. This summer, we've begun, begun these community discussions where we bring our people together to talk about the issues facing the Adirondacks. And at this time, uh, Climate change is something that touches just about every story that we write. So we're thrilled to have author Bill McKibben here with us today, whose new book, Falter, provides an essential wake-up call for all of us. And thanks to Adirondack Explorer Chairman Tom Curley, who is connected to Bill through the, the League of Extraordinary Adirondack Gentlemen, <laughs> or men who go camping, and he invited him here to speak. Bill's also been a good friend to the Explorer over the years. He was among an elite group who worked with our founder, Dick Beamish, to create the public publication 20 years ago. And we're grateful to the Wild Center and Executive Director Stephanie Ratcliffe for hosting us. The Wild Center has led the way on climate change in the Adirondacks through education and by engaging the next generation through its Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. So the format for tonight Bill is going to talk about his organization, 350.org, and the work they're doing on climate change around the world. Then I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll open the floor up to all of you and to our audience on Facebook. But first, Stephanie's going to talk some more about what the Wild Center is doing and the Youth Climate Summit. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you for um, bringing this program to us tonight. Um, welcome, and uh, thanks all you guys for coming. This is like a packed house. This is, I don't see it this way unless it's our Youth Climate Summit in November. So this is like really terrific for us. Um, is it not loud enough? Okay, is this better? Okay. Um, I can remember the first time I ever learned of global warming. I was one of a group of interns at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., touring all the museums and meeting all the people and researchers that work there. On one part of the tour, they led us past the dinosaur skeletons and back behind the locked doors, and they would let us into the storage area in which there were just corridors of row after row of shelves full of objects. And it seemed like if any of us kind of leaned too far on one of those shelves, they were just going to sort of fall over and crush us all. It was just like what you see in the movies. Um, and back uh, at a single desk, back in the corner, we met a scientist, and he began telling us about his work. Using diagrams and maps, he explained how industrialization was releasing too much carbon in the atmosphere and how it could not escape, thus heating the planet. This trapped heat would eventually melt the ice caps and flood coastal areas. I remember thinking it would, not, it would be uh, a good idea not to buy beachfront property. And I also thought about that maybe this person really had been in that little corner much too long. It was, I remember it was such clarity. It sounded crazy. It made an impression. Sorry. So you can imagine my reaction that year after year this prophecy became true. And it was widely reported. And I can remember a time, I never remember a time that I needed to be convinced. Um, and I'm grateful to Bill McKibben and others who brought this story um, to, the, to the general public. And I can, 
um, I tell this story because as I was standing there as an intern, sorry, there were people across the mall and in cubicles and corporate offices that was trying to keep that information in the basement of the Smithsonian. And that's what I learned by reading Falter, is seeing that um, systematic repression of that information. So, the Wild Center. We connect people to nature. And we know if pe people fall in love with nature, they're gonna take care of it. <clears throat> we held our first climate work 13 years ago. And from that work, we have a couple of programs I wanna tell you about, because I'm very proud of them. One is building a greener <clears throat> Adirondacks, which is a conference for contractors so that we keep them up to date on the latest building science so they can continue to embrace this change. The second is a Youth Climate Summit. I'm gonna show you a quick video. I know a lot of you are familiar with it, but you should, be, uh, you should know that we've helped over 70 summits in 30 locations um, across the world. But one other thing I wanna tell you about is how we do our work because I think it's important. One of the things we do is we have a cardinal rule and we, we never say you should. Instead, we bring people together, offer the latest um, scientific briefings, a myriad of solutions, and then we ask people to make their own decisions about what they want to do. We know this makes accountable to themselves and it makes, it makes them own these decisions. So I don't have to tell um, any of you that this is overwhelming. I'm clearly an example. <laughs> of that. But you see in this video will give you a sense of hope. Um, these young people are counting us to be on counting on us to be their allies in this work. They will have to deal with this crisis their entire lives. So I'm calling on all of you that you have the power in your circle of influence to make a difference. So use that circle of influence. Thank you. for your climate change is happening now it's not it's not our grandchildren's problem it's our problem and here in the Adirondacks we bring together about 200 students for two days to learn about climate change science impacts and solutions through cr the creation of climate action plans. You know, with summits all over the world, um, we've had like 60 summits now, like globally, and that is insane. Like start an environmental club at your school or go to your town and ask for a climate action plan. In addition to that, our green team has spoken at about a half dozen different climate summits around the state, sharing our experience with the projects that we've done um, and how we can create a climate action plan for others to follow as well. So the biggest thing I've probably done is a workshop teaching youth how to speak up to authority and like talk and talk about climate justice. And I think like the term, you know, like a climate summit, is just gonna become like a household thing. You can't just dump it on a different generation because the time to act is now. Hi everybody! Hi! <laughs> um, so my name is Hannah and I am going to have the pleasure of introducing Bill tonight. I know you probably like all know who he is, but it's a nice moment for me, so just all, you know, pay attention, <laughs> laugh along, all of that stuff. <laughs> so again, my name is Hannah. Um, this summer I was lucky enough to work here at the Wild Center as a part of their youth climate program. So, you know, we're back there, um, sort of like behind the bio building, but we do a lot of work <laughs> all around that's very public facing. Um, and right now I have my new home a couple towns over in the Hamilton Adirondack program and they're over there. There they are. 
Um, so just a couple towns over in Keene. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal impact Bill McKibben has had on my life. So going into Hamilton a couple years ago, I entered with like the, I'm going to save the world from climate change. Like, how am I going to do that, right? Um, so I started in environmental studies, and now I have a communications focus. So obviously, environmental studies, communication, activism, that's Bill. Um, so he's been a big inspiration for me. Um, I first heard about him when, you know, I started seeing, like, citations here, or, like, Bill McKibben does blah, 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 or, like, Bill McKibben jailed for a night, you know? Um, <laughs> lots of the stuff that he does. So um, I started getting to realize that anything that I saw with sort of, like, climate action or climate communication, anything around the Adirondacks or even around the world, a lot of it was tied back to Bill McKibben, to things that he has been collaborating with, um, Place, the organizations he's helped started, 350.org. Um, but so I've just, I've seen him over and over. And part of my goal for my life is taking people from sort of understanding the science of what's happening, um, why climate change is happening, and invigorating them to taking action. And there's really no better role model for me than Bill in this area. Um, so from his famous book, The End of Nature, which has been published in 24 languages, which is a lot of languages, um, to receiving the John Muir Award from the Sierra Club, uh, to helping create 350.org, which is now involved in the global climate strike on September 20th. Um, Bill is truly a jack of all climate trades. Um, so seeing him on best-selling lists, getting arrested on the front page of newspapers, uh, helping to organize events and strikes, um, I'm very excited today to see what his ideas are for all of us, how he can motivate us and give us a bunch of things that we can go out and do. Uh, so thinking of myself, I maybe can't get thrown in jail this year because I will be looking for a job in a couple of years. <laughs> and I need money. So <laughs> I'm hoping that um, Bill can motivate us all and sort of uh, put in a lot of ideas for us to go out there and each one of us take those actions, like Stephanie was saying, things we provide people, we can pick up what we want. Um, so anyway, I'm just excited to hear him talk. I'm excited to get motivated, and I hope you all too. So without further ado, probably did not need that long of an introduction, but Bill McKibben. <laughs> Hannah, thank you. Thank you, Hannah, very much. It's good to see you again. I got to see Hannah and her colleagues, Birch and others, this uh, summer we did a program for teachers up at um, whatever that new that house is on the end of the lake across from Camp Treetops there, that, uh, and it was Rocky House, Rocky house and it was, really, um, it was really a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here at the Wild Center, so thank you, Stephanie and everybody else. I saw Betsy Lowe on the way in, and she was reminding me of the night some time ago I don't even know when it was the afternoon when we did maybe almost the first sort of public fundraising event for this place and we were out standing on a you know a, a, overlooking what theoretically would someday be the wild center um, and and my it's been wonderful to watch it grow and become a kind of anchor of the Adirondacks and and provide uh, extraordinary level of understanding about the great issues that we face. What a remarkable place. And it's fun to be here with the explorer. Tom, thank you for asking me. Of course, I've faithful reader of the explorer. I know that I'm supposed to read it so that I can constantly be reforming my opinion on whether or not we should have a tourist train or a bike path through the... Um, <laughs> But there are, there's few controversies I've just decided that I'm not going to ever form an opinion on. There are very few, but th this is one. So I read, I concentrate on the parts about, you know, where to go paddle and what to, uh, and I remember once uh, when Phil Brown was the editor, he asked me to go ski the Jackrabbit Trail to do a story about it. And I, I see Jack Burke here tonight. So he, you know, he, we, we started off down the Jackrabbit Trail from his house in Paul Smith's, and 
I skied all day long and ended up in, uh, you know, 53 miles later or something in uh, pretty much at the bark eater there where it come, the trail comes out behind Pitchoff. And I properly wrote up my story and turned it into Phil. And he said, he said, well, this is good, but you were only supposed to ski the part from Saranac Lake on. I don't know why you did this extra 20 miles at the start. So, you know, just to say, I, you, I get confused sometimes. And, um, but not really on the subject that we're here to talk about tonight. Um, well, look, um, there's some reasons for hope and optimism, and I'll get to them eventually. Uh, in fact, there's real reason for hope today. If I wasn't here with you now, I, I'd be in New York City because um, my new friend Greta Thunberg arrived via sailboat this afternoon. And <clears throat> I've been hearing from her as she went across the Atlantic and there was a, apparently a crowd of, uh, of 500 or 1,000 people there to welcome her uh, as she came ashore in New York. And it's very good to have this great activist on our shores. And there's a lot of other great work going on, especially as Hannah points out, leading up to this big climate strike on September 20th, which will be, I think, the largest day of climate action that we've yet seen. So we'll get to some of that hopeful stuff as we end. But we're not gonna start there. We're gonna start with the hard stuff for a minute um, and just get through it. Because in, I mean, the, the key point here is we have a lot of work to do to deal with climate change. And if we're going to understand the scale and the pace of the solutions that we need, then we need to understand the scale and the pace of the problem that we face. Otherwise, we may be doing things that are well-intentioned but too small to, at this point, actually make a difference. And the sort of things that we need to be doing has changed over time. As Hannah pointed out, I wrote the first book about climate change for a general audience. It came out in 1989, which I'm well aware was well before Hannah was born. And um, 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 30 years ago, in fact, next month is the anniversary of that book. Uh, I was 28 at the time, so I was a young person uh, once myself. And, and, and uh, there were lots of things that could have been done 30 years ago uh, that would have helped a lot and set us on a new course. And those things probably no longer are sufficient just because we're so much further down the track. Human beings have emitted more carbon dioxide since 1989 than in all of human history before. So let me start just by showing, well, just I'll show a few pictures from, uh, this is from my, this is from this time last summer. This is where I was this week last summer. I'm showing them to you in part because uh, these are from Greenland and you need to know what your new, you know, territory is going to look like. Um, 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 I got to say, uh, uh, politics aside, that just was one of the oddest <laughs> single things I've ever seen. But. Um, um, Greenland is extraordinarily beautiful, uh, one of the most remarkable places in the world. As you know, it's where most of the ice in our hemisphere is stored. Uh, the ice sheet covers a vast, vast, vast territory, the biggest island on Earth, and it's a mile or thicker more in many places. You can see this is a glacier heading back up onto the sort of giant, endless ice cap that covers the middle. So it's beautiful to see, and it's also sobering to see it melting and melting fast. Uh, I don't know whether you can fully make out this picture or not. Uh, this is the boat that I'd organized a kind of expedition that I'll tell you about. You can see the boat's in the middle of a big bay with water as far as you can see. But I, I was standing next to the captain and looking up at the um, electronic chart above it, and you can see that the cursor indicating where our boat is is about a mile onto solid ground. And I, with, with mild trepidation, I pointed this out to the captain. And, and he just laughed and said, oh, the chart is five years old. Everything around here was frozen as far as you could see five years ago. You know? Now, I was there because I wanted to take these two people up onto the ice cap and have them do. They're both poets. 
Uh, one is from Greenland, the woman in black, Aka Niviana, and the other is from the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific, a remarkable poet named Kathy Jetnil Kajiner, an old friend of mine. And I'd wanted to get her, and she found Aka, up on this ice cap to do their poetry, uh, uh, film it, and in, in fact, I urge you to go look at it on YouTube. It's five million or eight million. I mean, people have watched this six-minute poem they did. It's incredibly powerful because Kathy from the Marshall Islands is literally standing on the ice that when it melts will drown her home. The highest point in the Marshall Islands is about a meter above sea level. There's very little chance that they're going to make it through this century, even though people have lived on those islands for many, many thousands of years. And so it's very beautiful and angry and generous poem and a reminder of something that I, I'll maybe just say once, but we should keep always in our minds. Among all the other things about climate change, probably the most important is it's the most unjust thing we've almost ever figured out how to do. There's an almost perfect inverse correlation between how much of this problem you caused and how badly it's hurting you now. If you're a farmer in Bangladesh who did nothing to cause this problem, odds are you're already having to figure out how to leave your home and move to a cardboard box on the edge of the capital city, you know, because the ocean's rising so fast. It's fine to have it on. Uh, that I shot with my cell phone as we were we'd, we'd, we were in a helicopter because we've been changing some of the instruments that the scientists use to record the recision of the glacier. And it'll take a minute or two to get to the really good part. So I'll just say as I'm doing it, as we're watching here, that the way to think about climate change is it's by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. So far, we've raised the temperature of the Earth about one degree Celsius with all the carbon dioxide that we have put up into the atmosphere by burning coal and gas and oil. Um, one degree doesn't sound like that much, but it turns out to be a lot. If you measure the heat equivalent, every day we trap the heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs in our atmosphere. That's a lot of heat, and it explains why, for instance, things have begun to go very badly up in the far north. We've now lost more than half of the summer sea ice in the Arctic over the last 20 years. And every minute of every hour of every day, something like this is happening. That's, this ice is 120 feet high, so that's a 12-story building. Okay, And just as we happen to be going over it, it let loose. And, the pilot kind of wanted to get out of there because those waves were 60, 70 feet high. But I convinced him just to, to hover around it for a minute because it was both incredibly beautiful and incredibly sinister. Um, that's happening now, as I say, every second someplace. And every time it does, the oceans rise some fraction of a millimeter. And the Earth changes in the most profound ways. When I was writing about this 30 years ago, we were offering warnings of what was going to happen. And now we just give you bulletins from the front lines about what is happening day after day after day. And it gets worse every year. July that we just came through was the hottest month we've ever measured on planet Earth. Okay? It's gotten so hot that there's plenty of places where it's just almost impossible now for people to be at different parts of the year. Uh, summer before this, we had the highest temperatures we've ever recorded on this planet, reliably recorded. It got to about 129 and a half degrees in a series of cities around the Middle East and Pakistan. Um, um, 129 degrees, uh, the dew point on some of those cities, the feels like temperature was in the 160s. Um, um, the human body can deal with 129 degrees for a few hours, okay? But after that, no way. Your body just can't cool off fast enough to keep up. And the science indicates very clearly that on current trajectories, 
the temperature will go up not one degree, but about three degrees Celsius over the course of this century. And that will mean that a huge swath of land stretching through the Asian subcontinent into the North China Plain around the Middle East will have temperatures like that for weeks upon weeks upon weeks in the course of a year. Okay? And if that happens, people really won't be able to live there. The World Labor Organization estimates that people are already only able, are able to, their ability to work outside to farm, which is what most human beings still do for a living, has dropped about 10% because it's just gotten too hot and too humid, and it'll drop 30% or so by the middle of this century, which isn't very far away. Um, um, the most basic things about being human, about the world that we inhabit, are called into question. And we just see them now constantly. I mean, everybody watched those films, the TV last summer, last fall, of uh, a city in California, literally called Paradise, literally turning into hell inside half an hour. And when you watched him, if you've lived like many of us have lived, I've lived my whole life on uh, rural forested communities with a two-lane road in and out, um, you had some sense of what it might be like to try and flee a fire on both sides of a road as trees came crashing down around you. Uh, this kind of thing is now all over the world. As we sit here today, there are massive record fires burning in Siberia, uh, even parts of Greenland, the peat. There's no trees, but the peat has caught on fire in places that are exposed. Alaska's lost two million acres uh, so far this summer. Um, and of course, you've seen the almost unbelievable pictures from the Amazon. Uh, where they're pursuing a conscious policy now of deforesting it at a rapid rate as you know, their new ruler tries to make his mark. Um, it's a really, really hard moment right now. Things are going very much in the wrong direction. We calculate the level of CO2 in the atmosphere from an instrument on the side of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. It's been in operation since 1959, and every year it goes up, uh, 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 and it goes up more. The high point's always about the 31st of May for the year, because after that there's enough vegetation growing in the northern hemisphere and temporarily sucking some of that carbon back. So May 31st this year, it hit 415 parts per million CO2. Um, that's, uh, well, I mean, that's way, way, way north of where we could safely be. The organization that I started 10 years ago has the name 350 parts, the 350.org because 350 parts per million is what the scientists have told us is the maximum safe level, okay? Um, um, we're now going up two or three parts per million per year. We're way, way north of where we should be. That's why the Arctic melts. It's why California burns. And it's why we have to move at such an extraordinary pace now if we have any hope of catching up with the physics. All right. That's the really tough part. We're through it. Everybody take a breath. I will. And we will move on. We'll talk about what we're going to try to do. Let me tell you a piece of good news. And the piece of good news is that though the politicians haven't done their job and many others haven't done their job, the engineers actually have done a really good job over the last decade or so. The most encouraging thing that's happened on the planet over that decade is that the price of generating power from the sun and the wind has plummeted. It's dropped 90%. It's gone from being an expensive kind of uh, uh, gimmick to being the thing that has the chance of powering us through this crisis and giving us a way out. Generating power from the sun and wind is now the cheapest way to make electricity in most of the world, including most of the United States. And we can use electricity, and we're going to need to, to do most of the things that we should be doing, uh, including if we're going to have to have cars driving them on electricity. 
<clears throat> can you not hear me? Let me see if I can, I'm bad at these things. Uh, let me see if I can move this up a little bit, get it any closer. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to turn it up. <laughs> see if, does that help any? Is that a little better? All right, I'm going to start all over again. No, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, you, it's good because you missed all this scary and horrifying stuff, and, and now we we'll just have. So that's an enormous gift, that drop in the price of sun and wind power. It means that if we wanted to do something about this, we could. We could move with real speed. If we went at it the way that you know we went at things at the beginning of World War II, which was probably the last time we faced a real existential crisis with the rise of fascism in Europe, then we'd be able to transform the country and the world in, it wouldn't be easy, it wouldn't be cheap, but it would be doable. So, if we have the greatest problem we ever faced, and we have a few solutions that we can point to, the interesting difficult question, and Stephanie alluded to this, is why aren't we doing those things at the pace we should be doing them? I mean, obviously at the moment with the current federal administration, we're not doing them at all. We're going backwards as fast as we can. But even before that, we weren't doing them at the pace that's required to catch up. And the answer, I'm afraid to that, is the thing that took me a long time to figure out. Um, when I started doing all this, my assessment was that we were in an, an argument about climate change. And the job of people like me was to convince people that it was real, to win that argument. And you know, I'm a writer, so you know, what do I, you know, I write books, so you know, write more books, have more talks, do more symposiums, have, you know, all the things that would allow reason to kind of bring itself to bear. And so I diligently did that for quite a while, longer than I should have, because at some point it began to dawn on me that we were not actually in an argument, that we had won the argument long before, by 1995 or so, the world scientists were in complete agreement about what was going on. I mean, there was no mystery here. We'd won the argument, we were just losing the fight, because the fight wasn't about studies and data and Oh, the fight was what fights are always about, money and power. And the other side in this fight, the fossil fuel industry, had more money than any industry on earth, and hence they had more power. Enough power to, in essence, try and keep their business model going, even at the cost of breaking the planet. Now that sounds hyperbolic to say, and I wouldn't have said it that way even a few years ago, because I really do try not to exaggerate ever. We've had great investigative reporting in the last four or five years, from the LA Times, from the Columbia Journalism School, from a bunch of places. Um, and what they've done is gone and looked in archives and talked to whistleblowers and established beyond any doubt that 40 years ago, in the early 1980s, the late 1970s, the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change. If you think about it now, it makes sense, you know. I mean, a company like Exxon was the biggest company on Earth. It had great scientists, and its product was carbon. So, of course, they were going to figure out what was going on. And they did. By the early 1980s, their scientists were telling their senior management how much it was going to warm and how fast. And when you look at the charts they drew, it's uncanny. They were hitting it dead on for where we are right now in terms of how much carbon there'd be in the atmosphere and how hot it would be. And their executives believed them. A company like Exxon began to build every drilling rig it built higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming. Okay? What they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us Instead, they embarked on this massively expensive and ambitious program uh, to, well, to lie. Uh, they built this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation, hiring people who had worked previously for the tobacco industry and exploiting all the same weaknesses in our system to delay action, to keep anything from happening. They were successful beyond their wildest dreams. We went from the point where 30 years ago, 
the Republican President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, said, we will fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. You know, a, a good, stalwart, strong thing to say when the world scientists come to you with a grave problem. We've gone from that to the point where the current Republican occupant of the White House believes that climate change is a hoax manufactured by the Chinese, okay? Which is a position delusional enough that if you were, you know, sitting on the Amtrak next to someone who was muttering it, you would get up and change seats, okay? <laughs> but that's where we are now, you know? That's what happens if you have 30 years and an unlimited budget to sort of tell lies. Those lies turn out to have been the most consequential lies in human history because they cost us those 30 years, which were the 30 years we desperately needed. We should have been, and as I said earlier, there were things we could have done 30 years ago that would have made an enormous difference. A modest price on carbon 30 years ago would have turned the super tanker that is our economy a few degrees to port, I guess. Um, uh, and 30 years later, we would have sailed into a different ocean, you know? Um, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't be done with solving climate change because it's a big problem, but we'd be well on the way. Instead, we stayed absolutely straight ahead and we accelerated, okay? So now we're at the point where small changes don't really help very much. Now we're at the point where we have to do big things and do them fast. And happily, people, especially young people, are coming up with some of those ideas. You've seen discussion of the Green New Deal over the last year, uh, which is remarkable legislation beginning to take shape from um, New York. New York's wonderful congresswoman, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, and a number of other people uh, uh, that would try to start catching up, to try and start making change at the pace we need to make it. It would mandate a whole series of changes that would try and cut our use of fossil fuel in half by 2030, which is where the scientists tell us we need to be, if not to stop global warming or reverse it, just to keep it from getting way, 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 way worse than it already is, okay? <coughs> so, those kind of changes are what's needed, and we can talk about them in more detail. But truthfully, I'm not gonna spend most of this time talking about the exact set of policies, because the exact set of policies don't matter until we have the political will to do what needs to be done. The real job at the moment is building that political will, putting together the movements that make change. And I will, talk briefly about that um, because it's what I've spent most of the last 10 or 12 years doing. Um, my sense was, once I'd figured out we were in a fight, obviously we weren't going to match Exxon dollar for dollar or anywhere close. Um, we were going to have to use the other kind of currency that history indicates sometimes you can use passion, spirit, creativity, uh, uh, sometimes willing to spend your body maybe and go to jail, um, that allow the construction of movements that are the reason that we, you know, have laws about civil rights and the reason that women can vote and the reason that we now treat gay people uh, uh, like everybody else and so on and so forth. Um, we started 350.org really about a decade ago. And there was no global climate movement at the time. So 350 began inauspiciously. It was myself and seven undergraduates at Middlebury across the lake. Um, and we had no money and we had no idea what we were doing and except that we wanted to organize the whole world around climate change. So there were seven students and there are seven continents and each one took one. Um, the guy that took the Antarctic had to take the internet also, you know. So we set out to try and organize and, and uh, it turns out that there's not everywhere someone called an environmentalist, but there's everywhere someone who's worried about 
hunger, public health, women's rights, war and peace, all the things we're not going to have on a rapidly degrading planet. And those were our allies. And we just told everybody, look, do something. We're going to all try to do something on the same day to kind of draw attention to this. This was 10 years ago, before this was in the public eye in the same way it is now. And we had no idea if it would work, you know. We got the first sense that it might a couple of days early. We told everybody to do this on a Saturday in the autumn of 2009. On the Thursday, we were sitting around our little one-room office, and the phone rang, and it was our leader in Ethiopia. Like all of us, she was a volunteer. Like most of us, she was a she. Like many of us, she was 17. Greta Thunberg's not the first young person to do this work. Young people have been leading this fight from the start. You know. She was in tears on the phone. She said, the government's taken away our permit for Saturday. Uh, so we're going to do this today before they can stop us, which was brave because it's not a really nice government. Um, but that wasn't why she was crying. She just kept saying, I do this the same day as everybody else. We wanted to be part of the whole world working on this. We don't want to spoil it for everybody. We're really sorry. And we have 10,000 young people right now out in the street in Addis Ababa chanting 350. So we were, well, don't worry about the date. You've done well. And they had done well. They'd sort of kicked off this weekend that turned into, well, there were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries around the world. CNN called it the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. It was remarkable watching those 5,200, watching pictures come flying into our little office there over that weekend. One of the things that was most moving for me and most instructive was I'd always been told that environmentalism was something that rich white people did and that if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist and on and on and on. And it took about half an hour of watching those pictures come in to just realize that was nonsense. That almost everybody we were working with around the world was poor, black, brown, Asian, young. Because that's what almost everybody in the world is. Okay? And they were exactly as concerned about this problem as anybody in this room. Maybe more so because the, <laughs> the world bears down hard. But they brought wit to bear on this um, um, of all kinds. <laughs> They brought religious fervor to bear. This was the, before this, this was the first time this had become a kind of religious issue. There's the head of Muslim South Africa, of indigenous groups behind them, the Anglican Archbishop at the head of a big march across Cape Town. Uh, on and on and on. 200 big demonstrations in China. Not an easy place to organize. Some people got arrested. Uh, uh, but China's doing remarkable things. They're putting up renewable energy faster than anyone's ever seen it on the planet now. Um, um, those are our <laughs> brothers and sisters in the Maldives. That's their student government association. They're holding their meeting in the lagoon to demonstrate the existential problem that comes when you live in an island archipelago where the highest point is about a meter and a half above sea level. This place is paradise. It's all white sand and coconut palms. People have lived there for 5,000 years, and it's going to be gone. So. Um, uh, there were three or four hundred pictures from that first weekend that just ended up in a file marked 350 adorable. Um, and they were very adorable. And they were also just hard to look at. I mean, those girls are going to be refugees. And it's not because of something they did. It's because of stuff that we did. Okay? We've gone on. We've done, we think, 20,000 rallies in every country but North Korea now. And I could literally show you pictures all day, and I'd like to, because they're fun and beautiful, and they give you a sense of all the people at work around the world to kind of deal with this crisis. And it always makes me happy and optimistic. And We did these enormous art projects. They called them the biggest art project of all time because we had to keep borrowing satellites to take pictures of them. That's one of them in the dry southwest when the 
satellite came over, two or 3,000 people organized by the museum there, put blue blankets up overhead for a second just to bring their river momentarily back to life. This is the kind of work that we'd like to keep doing. It's basically educational, um, and it helps us change at the pace that would be most congenial. Human beings and their institutions change best when they change slowly and gradually. That's the most convenient, economical, untraumatic way for things to change. But we do not have that luxury. We've wasted the last 30 years not changing at all, so now we have to change fast. And as a result, we've gone from organizing education to spending a lot of time organizing confrontation. These are some pictures from the start of the fight over the Keystone Pipeline in 2011, which turned into the first big battle against fossil fuel infrastructure on this planet. A battle happily that, I mean, so far so good, we haven't built Keystone. The president believes that we have, and he keeps giving talks to people in which he boasts about how he signed the legislation allowing them to build Keystone on his first day in office. And isn't it great? still not been built and we're still fighting hard. More to the point, um, it showed people that you could stand up to big oil and so now everything gets bought. Nobody builds a frack well, a coal mine, an LNG terminal, a pipeline without a big fight. We win a ton of those fights, it must be said. It's amazing how often when you fight you win and even when we lose, we win because it makes it slower and more difficult for this industry to do what it wants to do. And every month that passes, remember, those engineers back in the lab are dropping the cost of a solar panel another percent or two and making the spreadsheet you know, that much harder. So we've, uh, we've also, I'll just flip through a bunch of pictures here because I don't want to, I, I feel like I'm <coughs> rambling. Um, we don't know, you know, the degree to which we've gotten started in time. There's obviously things we're going to lose. There's obviously horrors we can no longer prevent. This is Siberia. We get big forest fires four or five degrees of latitude north of where we've ever seen them just because it's so hot and so dry up there now. Um, these are people who've already left their homes in Micronesia because the ocean invaded. That top red balloon is where the Dead Sea was 40 years ago. If it's not drought, then it's the opposite, flood. These are people in that zone in Pakistan where they had the biggest flood since Noah in 2010. It rained so hard up in the Khyber Pass, the kind of rain you can only have in a globally warmed world because remember, warm air is capable of holding more water vapor than cold. That's why we had, for instance, the biggest rainstorm in American history two years ago with Hurricane Harvey in Houston, which dropped more than five feet of water on places in Texas. Think about that for a minute. Um, in Pakistan, the Indus River flooded to the point where it covered a quarter of the country. 20 million people had to leave their homes. That's like if you had to evacuate everyone from Boston to Baltimore during an emergency, okay? And as you can tell from looking at them, they did not cause the problem from which they are suffering. Um, so, you know, in fact, a way of thinking about it is just to remind ourselves, uh, this picture I found not long ago and wanted to show for two reasons. One is because we don't know if those kids are alive anymore. The year after that was taken, the most savage hurricane ever to hit that part of Haiti swept through that southwest peninsula and destroyed 80% of the buildings in Lake Kay. Caused a lot of people to die. Hurricanes draw their heat power from the heat in the first few meters of the sea's surface. Okay? We don't know if they're alive. But also, their signs just from your actions affect me. Completely true, that's why they may be dead, but not vice versa. There's nothing they can do to solve this problem. They can't use less fossil fuel. They're not using any now. They can't go to the White House and protest because we don't let Haitians come into the country, certainly for purposes like that. And they can't like divest their holdings in fossil fuel companies, I guarantee you. 
that there's more stock holdings in this room tonight than in all of Haiti. You know? um, um, so what they can do is turn to us and try to build the sort of global efforts that we can. That divestment of stock is a perfect example. In 2012, we started a big campaign modeled on the one that helped take down apartheid in South Africa. This has now grown much bigger. Next week in New York, we'll have a press conference celebrating the fact that we're at $9 trillion worth of endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. And it's put huge pressure on this industry. Shell said earlier this year that it was now a material risk to their business. People in New York City can be proud. The, state, the city divested its pension funds, dollars pension funds, fossil fuel last year. The rest of us in New York can be not proud because uh, New York State and its treasurer, Tom DiNapoli, have refused to do this. They've kept their $200 billion invested in Exxon, Iran, and in all the other people who triggered this crisis and continue to drive it. Um, that's, if you want someone to write, Tom DiNapoli would be a useful person to have on your list. Uh, I, I, I'll just show you a few more pictures, just to give you the, the good impression that people are now resisting and resisting in all kinds of ways. These are pictures from uh, New York City when we had 400,000 people in the streets a little while ago. There's probably a few people in this room who were there for that, and it was a great day, and all over the world. But let me just, uh, just end with a couple of pictures from my favorite organizers around the world. Uh, our 350 crew in the South Pacific, the Pacific Climate Warriors. Um, we were marching. They, on those islands in the South Pacific, those nations that are at great risk, uh, Nauatu, Tuvalu, the Marshalls, Micronesia, the Solomons, um, um, they each built a canoe, a kind of traditional war canoe the islands, and they took them to Newcastle in Australia, which is the biggest coal port on planet Earth. More coal moves through it than any place else in the world. And for a day, they used those canoes to blockade the harbor and the biggest ships in the world, these ore ships headed off for Asia with that coal. It was a powerful symbolic action. In fact, a month later, the city council of Newcastle, Australia, biggest coal port in the world, divested its pension holdings. Fossil fuel is a kind of jet South Pacific. Um, but the reason I show it to you is I just want that image stuck in your head. Since I'm a writer at heart, I know that there's a few tropes that you know repeat themselves in literature over and over and over again. And one of the most powerful uh, is the sort of small and many against the mighty and the few. So the Israelites against the Pharaoh, you know. Uh, the Death Star against the Rebel Alliance, all right. Um, and once you start looking for them, you see them everywhere. That was the same summer in Seattle. That colossal thing over there is a 40-story drill rig that Shell Oil had purchased in order to go try and open up the Arctic for oil drilling. Okay, think about that just for a minute, okay? Just to remind you of how we're currently conducting business on this earth. Scientists had explained, as Stephanie pointed out, many, many, many years ago, that if we burned all this coal and gas and oil, we would melt the Arctic. Turns out they were right. The Arctic melted. Did Shell Oil look at that and think, huh, Maybe we should go into the solar panel business instead? No. Uh, Shell Oil looked at that and thought, huh, now that it's melted up there, it'll be easier to drill for more oil. Okay. So, which, I mean, look, that, that for me calls into question whether the big brain was a good evolutionary adaptation or not. All right. Um, but, the good news is there were tons of people with perfectly good brains attached to very big hearts who got in the way. Okay? They got out there in small craft of all kinds. We, of course, called them kayaktivists. Um, and 
for a week, they kept that Colossus in port until the Coast Guard finally cleared a path for it. By that time, the damage had been done. The damage to Shell's brand and reputation was so great, they knew they could not stand pictures like this week after week after week, that within a few months, they'd announced they were pulling the plug on drilling. In the said we'd spent $9 billion, but we're not going to spend any more. We just can't. Um, that's what can happen when people come together in numbers large enough to make a difference. And we've got to do it now. Um, let me just end with the questions in a second, but let me just end with that kind of basic, basic pitch for what we need you all doing. Um, September 20th is next big date on the climate calendar. Some of you have watched this past year as first Greta Thunberg and then a million or more students around the world have gone on weekly climate strikes. Um, uh, she was the Swedish schoolgirl who this month last year just sat down in front of parliament in Stockholm with a sign that said on climate strike. And when people interviewed her, she said, well, if adults can't be bothered to prepare a world that I can safely live in, then it's a little much to demand that I spend eight hours every day preparing myself for this world that isn't going to work. I'll go back when you do what you're supposed to do. You know? And the logic of that was immediate and powerful and spread around the world. In May, at the biggest of these climate strikes, there were 1.4 million school children around the world out of school. And at the end of that day, they asked a bunch of us if we would try and recruit adults for a strike in September. So that's September 20th is that day. Um, it, it comes right before Greta will address the UN General Assembly. Uh, we need everybody figuring out what they can do. If you have a small business, if you're teaching, if you're studying, if you're uh, retired, if you're, whatever it is you're doing, you need to figure out how to organize and coordinate that day. I'm not completely sure what's going on in this part of the world, but someone will know. And, and watch for it, and you'll be able to find, you can get information from globalclimatestrike.net. Mm -hmm. That'll be the next opportunity, but there's going to be more like it. Um, and we need people taking part. Really important to figure out what you can do in your own life, you know, how you can make your own house or whatever more energy efficient and not waste. But at this point, that isn't going to do the trick. We can no longer solve this crisis one Prius at a time, one vegan dinner at a time, okay? Those things are good, but what if we're going to solve it, it's going to be because we get people together in numbers large enough to make a difference. We have some sense of what those numbers are like. The first Earth Day in 1970, we think uh, about 20 million Americans were in the streets. That would have been 10% of the then population of the United States. And that was enough, it turned out. Over the next couple of years, Richard Nixon, who had not an environmental bone in his body, signed into law, you know, into law all the statutes, the revisions to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, all the laws that Trump is now trying to gut uh, 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 on behalf of, of his friends. Um, Tom Jorling, who's here tonight, helped do some of that work, original work, and thank you for it, to get those encoded and into law. Um, that's what happens when you get a lot of people into the street. We need those people back in the street, and we need them all over the world. And those people are you uh, and us. And this is the existential challenge of our time. So um, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just say um, planet is way outside its comfort zone, you need to be outside your comfort zone in order, and I, that's going to mean different things for different people. For some people it means, you know, donating more money than they really want to. Some people it means uh, 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 risking the, you know, approbation of their neighbors by, you know, 
getting really visibly involved. Sometimes it means going to jail. Um, um, uh, Anna was pointing out that it's not her job to go to jail. She's been working hard on all of this. I remember writing the letter asking people to come get arrested before the Keystone Pipeline in Washington eight years ago. And this was the first big civil disobedience action in the environment. Years. The biggest about anything in a long time. 1,200 people went to jail. Uh, and that was enough to get that fight rolling. Um, but I, in that letter, I said, this is not the place where young people need to be the cannon fodder. Okay? Um, be writing a resume soon. And an arrest record's not the best thing. One of the unmixed blessings of growing older is past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you? You know? <laughs> um, and, and so on all fronts, we need people deeply engaged. I'll just say when we did that thing in Washington, we did not ask people as they were getting arrested how old they were. But we did say, who was president when you were born? Okay. And the two biggest groups were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. Really good. In no small part because there were a lot of young people there and it was good for them to see elders acting the way we actually need elders to act in a working civilization. Okay? Fulfilling the kind of role that, that we should be fulfilling. I'll end just by saying, even if we do all this stuff, there's no guarantee that we're going to win this fight. We don't know. Um, it's not like other fights we've been in. Dr. King used to end every talk. He'd quote from the, David, I think from Theodore Parker, the Massachusetts abolitionist. Is that where you think this might have come from? Yeah. Say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Okay? In other words, this may take a while, but we're going to win which is a very comforting thought. And people had to be extraordinarily brave, obviously, in that. We don't have that comforting thought. The arc of the physical universe is short, and it bends toward heat. If we don't win soon, then we do not win. Nobody has a plan for how to refreeze the Arctic once it melts, for how to make the Amazon grow again once it gets burned down. Okay? Um, 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 that's why the next two, three, four, five years will probably tell the tale. So if you've been keeping your powder dry, keep it dry no longer. Um, 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 we don't know how it's going to come out, but we do know, and uh, you've seen some of the pictures to indicate, that there is a real fight underway. And that's the fight of our time. So thank you all very much. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm going to say before I even put this on. Can you can, you well, can. before I ask any questions anyway, I want to say that um, this was very inspiring. And if you haven't read Falter yet, we are selling copies of it out in the lobby, and um, Bill has signed them check, for you. Check, so. check, So since you brought up going to jail, I'm going to start with that. You recently uh, <laughs> were <laughs> in Glens Falls uh, in Elise Stefanik's office, and you wrote an article for The New Yorker recently and talked about the connection between climate change and immigration. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about that sure. connection? Sure. So the, let's talk about the connection first. Um, look, the people are now leaving their homes in large numbers, not because they want to, but because they have no choice. And, and a large part of that no choice is because the climate where they live is changing dramatically. We got the first huge sense of this in Syria. Uh, you know, in the earlier parts of this millennium, 25, 2005 to 2010 or so, they had the greatest 
drought in what in my schoolboy days we called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, the history, the thousands of years of history, and, and people just couldn't grow food. So people left their farms, a million Syrians moved into cities in the course of a year. That was the thing, maybe the single biggest thing that destabilized that part of the world. There was already obviously a brutal regime there, the Assad regime, but they could not cope with, and, and that was one of the sparks for this revolution, which in turn flung a million or so refugees out into Western Europe, and as you know, discombobulated the politics of that region. There was a great story in the Times a few weeks ago about how it was largely the huge drought in Central America, Honduras and Guatemala above all, that was driving much of the exodus north to our border and discombobulating our politics in ugly and crude ways. This is just the tiniest foretaste of what we can expect. The UN estimates that we should see someplace between 200 million and a billion climate refugees in the course of this century, okay? Billion people on the move. If anything like that ever happens, then the prospect for any kind of peace or security or stability or anything on our planet's nil. And it makes even stupider and more insulting and, and, and horrible the current our current method as a country of dealing with uh, people seeking asylum or refuge or whatever. I mean, there obviously are not enough cages and walls to keep a, a billion people in, you know, uh, where you want them to be. Remember that the people living in Honduras and Guatemala who can no longer grow food on the fields where all their forebears were able to grow food did not cause the problem that is forcing them to do what no human being ever really wants to do, get up and leave the place where they live and go someplace else. We caused that problem, so we better come to some new arrangement. That's what we were trying to say at Congresswoman Stefanik's office. Um, it turns out that if you want to do civil disobedience, she's very obliging. Um, uh, uh, we just went into the office and said, can we talk to the, and they, she, they said, as we knew, well, she's in Washington. I said, that's good. We'll just, can you get her on the phone or, you know, FaceTime or Skype or whatever? And at which point they, they just said, no, we're closing the office. It was three in the afternoon and they called in the, uh, the police in Glens Falls, where it turns out there's apparently not ever been a civil disobedience action before. The police could not have been nicer. The slightly puzzled uh, detective who was there said, you know this isn't going to do any good, right? And I was like, yeah, we sort of know that. But, um, but it was important to be there and make that witness. And I don't know what will happen. We have another court date in a week or so. Um, um, and it's never any fun to, to do things like that. Um, but I got to say, it, I now know from some experience that going to jail is not the end of the world. The end of the world is the end of the world, okay? So, so w whatever it is one's going to do, uh, 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 get to it, you know? That's it. So you've, you've built an incredible movement here, and you wrote your book, The End of Nature, 30 years ago. You started 350.org 10 years ago. How do you feel at this point about the Old. awareness? Yeah. <laughs> about the awareness that's been created around climate change. So finally, the awareness is beginning to catch up to the problem. Um, I mean, let me say first of all that in the rest of the world, that's no longer an issue. Almost every place else in the world, there's a full, clear consensus about the problem that we're in and what needs to be done about it. Uh, every other, almost every other government in the world is at work on this, even if they're conservative governments. You know, uh, Angela Merkel, the conservative leader of Germany, has been one of the most stalwart leaders on climate change around the planet, for instance. Um, we have obviously not been like that. Uh, there was highly normal, and, and I'm afraid, to see the scenes from the G7 summit when they were having their meeting on climate change and there was an empty seat where the President of the United States was supposed to be. Um, um, but I think that that's shifting and shifting fast. 
the polling, we did enough organizing, which helped, and Mother Nature has now hit us upside the head enough times that most people are understanding what's going on. The polling is now very clear that most Americans understand that we're in a serious problem. They may not understand quite the urgency of it, but they get what's happening. And among Democratic voters, this is now the number one issue, voting issue going into these primaries. And among young voters, people under the age of 30, it's the number one issue by a such a huge margin that essentially there are no other issues you know, that show up when they poll them. Um, that's why you're seeing Democratic candidates vying with each other to produce really powerful plans. It's always hard, the, the Democratic National Committee in their infinite wisdom over the weekend voted down the idea for a debate on climate change. Um, um, but the Democratic candidates are doing a very good job and, and I predict, I'm almost certain, that it'll be one of the issues that they hammer hardest on during the election because the polling data shows that of all the places where Trump is out of sync with the American electorate, the place where there's the widest gap is around climate change. Uh, most Americans are scared by the fact that their leader doesn't believe that physics and chemistry are real, you know. Um, um, at some level, that's an unsettling prospect. So here in New York State, we um, just passed an ambitious Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that calls for reducing emissions to 85% of 1990 levels by 2050. Um, what sort of opportunities does that present for those of us living here in New York? So this is it's very good news, and it's a testament to terrific organizing. Um, um, you know, New York uh, uh, could have gone in a very different direction. <clears throat> Five or six years ago, New York was poised to follow Pennsylvania as the kind of fracking capital of the East because of the Marcellus Shale that underlies most of the geology up until you reach the edge of the Adirondacks. Um, and those of you who've been to Pennsylvania know how comprehensively it's been trashed over the last decade uh, uh, by fracking and the damage that's been done to health and communities and everything else. Thank God people around upstate New York organized like people had never organized in this state before and built such a united front that Governor Cuomo had no choice but to ban fracking in this state. And from that great organizing, much else has followed. This Community Climate Protection Act was the work not only of those people who'd worked on fracking, but of environmental justice groups in the biggest cities in the state, in Buffalo, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx, uh, uh, people who've been, whose communities have been systematically trashed, um, demanding change. And so together they've put together this really ambitious bill, which the governor finally signed. Um, um, there's going to be some really good things one hopes happening as a result. One of the first will be big offshore wind development uh, in Long Island Sound, although the Trump administration is already suing to try and block it from happening. Um, but assuming we get past that, uh, uh, it'll be uh, uh, much of New York's power will start coming from the wind uh, offshore. There are going to be a lot of renewable stuff gets built onshore too. Probably more importantly, huge support for energy conservation, for making sure that we retrofit buildings, uh, uh, everything else very quickly to draw down the amount of energy that we're using. So. New Yorkers can feel pretty good right now about being towards the head of the pack. Uh, and that's good because it allows us, <coughs> to all of us, to work on the sort of broader issues, to be going after one of, the, I'll just say, one of the next big battles, I think, the kind of next extension of this divestment campaign uh, that we're going to be working on. I'm finishing up a piece for The New Yorker about it right now, is about the ways that the financial community in the world underwrites the fossil fuel industry. Chase Bank, headquartered in New York, biggest bank in the world, uh, lent over the last three years $186 billion to the fossil fuel industry. Okay? That's larger than the, uh, uh, net the uh, 
total value of a company like BP in three years of lending. Um, so we're going to be doing big campaigns to try and get them to stop. And that's going to mean trying and getting people to change where their bank and where they store their retirement funds and what their insurance company is and so on and so forth. There's tons of fights left to do. And New York obviously has a big role to play in this because New York is at the absolute center of the financial world. And so everybody in this room continues to punch above their weight if they're willing to get involved. Along those lines, we here in the Adirondacks see a problem and we want to do something to fix it. So uh, what can we do here to protect the future as individuals in our communities and for the whole park? So <coughs> these are very good questions. I just, uh, I, I, Everybody can figure out good things to do in their individual lives. And you know what most of those things are. You don't need me to tell you about them at this point. And communities increasingly can figure out how to come together. There's good projects going on. I was just learning about the community composting project that's happening here in Tupper with the Wild Center as a kind of core part of this work. So there are things like that that should definitely be going on and you should all be engaged in them. What I was trying to say before is the most important thing, however, that an individual can do is be less of an individual and join together in these movements now that allow us to make change on a larger scale. So we need you at places like 350.org, the Sunrise Movement, who are the young people that are working on the Green New Deal, Fridays for the Future, which is the kind of umbrella group that Greta Thunberg set up. We need you participating. We need you donating. We need you helping build movements because that's in the end what will change things. That's what changed things in the lifetimes of many people in this room around civil rights and race in this country because people were willing to build those <laughs> movements and people were willing obviously to make enormous sacrifices uh, to make that happen. This is no different. If we're going to get a hold on this, that's how it's going to be. So please figure out how to engage. I mean, uh, you know, everybody needs to just figure out what they have to offer. For some people, it's money. For some people, it's time. For some people, you know, you'll know. But if there's not a kind of arm of this near you, make sure that you start one and bring people together and connect up with this larger movement. Let me just finish by saying that the Adirondacks is in, you know, that we're, of course, as always, richly, richly blessed to get to live here. It's not that the Adirondacks is not going to have enormous problems from climate change like every place else it will, and it already is. Winter is changing. We see storms like Irene that are bigger than we can cope with, so on and so forth. But in a globally, in a fast warming world, we're going to have even more reason to give thanks to our forebears who set aside large pieces of land. Um, um, bigness is a important defense for biodiversity, for human economies, for communities. And, and, and the example uh, of the Adirondacks is going to be even more important in this century than it was in the last one. They didn't you know, know about climate change, obviously, when the legislature drew the blue line in the 1890s. But it was precisely for emergencies on this scale that it's a very good thing that we have conservation on this scale um, um, makes one appreciate them all the more. I heard you uh, talk about the climate crisis as an opportunity to make changes in power and wealth distribution. How do you see that playing out? Well, I guess if you looked at, and this is one of the things I write about in this most recent book, if you look at our planet, the two most the two most striking things about our time on Earth are one, this strange spike in temperature that we understand why it's happening, but it's unlike anything that's ever happened in human history. Um, that's the one strange thing. And the other strange thing is this extraordinary spike in inequality that we see uh, around the Earth, which is now just assumed, I mean, 
cartoonish proportions. The eight richest people in the world have more wealth between them than the bottom three and a half billion, the bottom half of the people on the planet. Okay? Um, um, and these things are not unconnected. I mean, one of the biggest sources of inequality, wealth and power in our world, is the fact that a few people happen to control access to the small deposits of coal and gas and oil on which everyone depends. That's why the Koch brothers are the most powerful players in our political world. They're our biggest oil and gas barons. I mean, they own more of the tar sands in Canada, where the Keystone Pipeline comes from, than anybody else. They own huge pipelines and refineries and things. That's why they have that kind of power. Now, there'll be rich people in the solar and wind world, but they won't be Koch brothers rich, uh, precisely because once you've put the solar panel on the roof, the power comes for free. Okay? That's why Exxon and the Koch brothers and so on hate it so much and fight it so hard. If you made an enormous fortune by making people write you a check every month of their lives for another delivery of oil, then, then the sun coming up in the morning and powering your life for free is the stupidest, most threatening business model you can imagine. Okay? And that's why it's been fought in the ways that it has. I mean, since unlike coal and gas and oil, sun and wind are ubiquitous, there's some of them everywhere, um, it will have a natural, to one degree or another, localizing and democratizing effect on our economy and on our lives. At the very least, we won't have to pay much attention anymore to the Koch brothers or to the Saudi royal family or to all the other people like that that currently blight our public lives. Um, 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 so that's, you know, that's a hopeful twist about what might happen if we did the right thing. I'm going to ask one more question and then let everybody else have a chance. How do you stay energized for this fight and all the, uh, with everything happening, the Amazon fires this past week, all the negative? I don't always. I mean, I get really discouraged sometimes and, and frankly, sometimes a little more as time goes on. But, uh, you know, because I know too much about the science and I understand the depth of the hole that we've dug ourselves into. But if I do find myself getting discouraged, one of the things I do is go look at pictures like the ones I've been showing you. We have uh, like 30 or 40,000 images like that in the Flickr files at, at 350.org. And the thing that I'm always struck at looking at them is, again, how many of them are, show people who didn't cause this problem and yet are willing to work hard to solve it. And when I see that, I think, okay, if they're willing, then I, I can certainly summon up the effort to, to work too. Um, um, it's really good to see young people taking the lead here. It makes sense that they're taking the lead because they're the ones, I'm going to be dead before the absolute worst of this hits. But if you're in college right now, you know, whatever career you're being expensively trained for at the moment, uh, you know, your job, if we don't get things under control, is going to be emergency response because that's what the world's going to be about in 30 or 40 years or sooner, you know. Um, so it's really good to see young people and very energizing to see them in the lead, but they're being very clear now that they want everybody else joining in. That's been Greta's message and everybody else's message for the last while. And if you think about it, there is something remarkably ignoble about letting 15-year-olds take responsibility for the gravest problems facing the planet, okay? So it would actually be good for, the, I mean, when kids ask for help, the correct response is yes. Good question. Is there a role for lawsuits against the great polluters? And happily, yes, and people are increasingly engaged in this. 
the day that New York City divested, it filed suit against the five biggest oil companies on the theory that their shareholders should have to pay for the seawalls that New York's having to build, you know, not the taxpayers of New York. Um, those same kind of suits have been filed all over the uh, country and the world. Um, truthfully, I think the ones that are in state court at the moment may have a better, may be more powerful. Uh, and there are, and the, the Attorney General of New York, Tish James, has filed suit against Exxon. The reason I say that is because I'm a little worried that the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court's not going to, you know, as federal cases get there, they may disappear. But absolutely, this is super powerful. This is what took down the tobacco industry and what's now beginning much too late to take down the opioid empires. Um, and, and you can tell that they're worried about it because the oil companies have begun making noises finally about maybe we could take a sort of slight tax on carbon as long as it came with a provision that you couldn't, that held us immune from any of the damage that we've caused to the planet. It's way too soon to be cutting that deal because that threat of liability uh, hanging over them is clearly the biggest, one of the biggest levers pushing at them. But Tish James deserves credit. Maura Healy, the Attorney General in Massachusetts, uh, others. Uh, and I think that if Democrats take control of Washington again, this is a place where the Attorney General will be, I mean, it's something that, something that Senator Warren has talked about a great deal in the course of the campaign. Mm. Sure. Uh, so fracking produced this immense amount of natural gas. Uh, and so everyone's trying to quickly take advantage of it by building new plastics factories uh, because natural gas is basically what you make plastic out of. Um, and this is obviously troubling for lots of reasons. Uh, the climate implications of continued fracking on the scale that we're doing it is are horrific because you release huge amounts of methane into the atmosphere, and that's a potent tr you know, heat trapping gas. And obviously, right at the moment, producing a lot more plastic is not actually the thing we most need on our planet. In fact, just the opposite, uh, a a as we've begun to understand. I mean, there, uh, currently, there's more, by weight, there's more plastic in the ocean than there is fish, okay? Um, um, I mean, it, we're, we're, this is a classic example of going in the wrong direction just as fast as you can. The current, I mean, the Obama administration, I'm afraid, takes a fair amount of the blame for doing this. They were very engaged in this building the fracking industry up quickly because it seemed to offer a kind of economic relief from the recession that they inherited. Um, but now the Trump administration could not be more you know, I mean, they're just removing every possible environmental regulation and law that gets in the way of doing this. People are fighting a valiant fight in legally and on the ground and everything else. It's possible that uh, if we elect someone else next November, we'll have managed to hold off some of the very worst of it. If he's elected to another term, then there's just no, I mean, forget it, the, the era of envir effective environmental regulation of any kind in our country is over if that happens. Good question. I mean, we do think that sun and wind are capable of providing most of what we need. The guy, uh, the guy who's done the best work on this is a guy at Stanford named Mark Jacobson. And if you Google him, you'll see an endless series of really interesting reports for every state in the union and most of the countries in the world detailing how they can, how they have access to plenty of supply of renewable energy. But <clears throat> one of the things that's making it easier by the way, to do that is that the price of batteries is now falling on the same plummeting curve that solar panels and wind turbines followed for the last decade. And batteries are obviously important because when the sun goes down, that's what we depend on. 
if you buy an electric car and plug it into the grid, then you've actually added another node to this battery system. And over time, that'll be one of the most important contributors to a kind of big, smart electric grid uh, <coughs> that equalizes power day and night. In the meantime, it's probably a bad idea to shut down existing nuclear reactors, um, at least the ones that aren't completely unsafe. So that's why New York, when it struck this deal, agreed that it would keep the reactors in upstate along Lake Ontario operating for the foreseeable future. They'd try to extend the license. I think that's probably smart because um, we need low carbon power going forward. Do I think new nuclear reactors are going to be a big part of this? I don't, mostly because they're unbelievably expensive. Um, the price of a solar panel keeps going like this and the price of a nuclear reactor just keeps going like this. It's, you're basically burning $20 bills to generate electricity. No one's going to do it without insane levels of subsidy from the government. Much cheaper to subsidize sun and wind going forward. The other thing is, as you know from just history, building a nuclear power plant takes a long time. Like decades is how long it takes to build them. And decade, time is the thing we have the least of. They just opened yesterday the biggest wind farm in northern Europe off, uh, off the coast of Scandinavia. Huge, uh, you know, much bigger than any in total than any nuclear power plant. It took them total start to finish a year and 10 months to build the whole thing. Um, that's the kind of speed that at this point we really need. Aha! Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, and one of the bigger issues. I was wondering how you would. Yeah, so this is the. This is, yeah, so the first thing is thank you very much for doing that. Second thing is it makes a big difference. The reason that we did the. The, one of the reasons we started the divestment thing, at first we, we didn't know how big it was going to grow, but we knew that there were important places, uh, colleges being a perfect example, that would set, uh, that would help people understand this issue and its importance. So I mean, by itself, will unions endowment solve the climate crisis? No, it will not. Will it send a super strong signal to everybody in the greater Schenectady area? that the most important institution, except maybe for GE in their town, has decided that it wants nothing to do with the fossil fuel industry? Yes, and will it be a particularly powerful one since it's in GE's home territory? Yes, it'll be extraordinarily powerful. But one of the things one hears all the time, and you hear it from the president, you know, like, uh, you know, why should we do anything if you know, China isn't doing I mean, anything? Or what? I mean, this is, I mean, Obviously, everybody has to do their part, and more than their part, you know. Um, um, yes, obviously, every single thing that we do is too small to matter. Our hope is that if they all happen at once, then they'll be big enough to matter. And that's how every problem ever gets solved, you know. Um, so thank you for pushing hard. If there are any union alumni uh, or alumni of other colleges in this place. Colleges are a it's very good idea. You, you'll notice that once you graduate, you, you haven't learned this yet, but once you graduate from college, your college is actually far more interested in you than they were while you were there. <laughs> um, and they'll constantly be sending you a series of envelopes. Um, and it's a very good idea to write back and say, I'm, I've treasured my union years and I can't wait till I'm um, um, able to help other people enjoy them, but I'm damned if I'm going to do it if you're just going to go invest the money in Exxon in the meantime. So as soon as you're done, I'm happy to give. That's powerful. Colleges really matter. Half the colleges in the UK have now divested from fossil fuel. That's one of the reasons that the conservative parliament in the UK passed the world's first climate emergency declaration. You know, every college board of trustees is made up of, you know, some of the most important people in the local community. This needs to be in their face all the time. I will say I'm a 
my alma mater, Harvard, has not divested. They'll probably be the last people in the world to divest because there's no one more closely linked to Wall Street. But it's super useful. Any, I mean, I last year went. The students asked me to come down, and I came down and spent the night in a sleeping in the shrubbery outside the president's office. <laughs> you know, um, um, and it was really powerful. Uh, it's really important. Uh, it gets in all the papers. It helps people. It educates each new group of students coming in. It's really good work that you're doing. Thank you. And I know people have been doing it at Hamilton, and I'm really grateful for that, and, and everywhere else too. So good on you. Mm. So, and nothing else. David, very good questions. First thing I'm going to say, it's not voting and nothing else, okay? Government's a really important power sector in our society, but so is the financial community. And, and, and I'm really, I, have, I actually have this strong feeling that it's probably at least as important to be pressuring Wall Street and the fossil fuel industry because it, for the simple reason that if they decided, if we could force them to move, it would happen very quickly. Markets move at extraordinary speed once they start moving. Governments, even under the best of circumstances, do not move at extraordinary speed. That said, your point is well taken. Elections matter enormously. And so, I mean, so we have, a, say, at 350.org, we have a, uh, a C4, uh, uh, the tax, the code that allows you to take part in political activity as a kind of adjunct to our other work. We have tons of young people, college students, uh, out all around the country this summer uh, standing on rope lines talking to, you know, asking presidential candidates question after question to make sure that they're solid and strong on climate issues. And they'll be, once, once we move, you know, into the next uh, into the general election, I think that they'll be strongly engaged, we'll all be strongly engaged in that fight. One of the things that we've got, one of the things that has to happen is none of this, um, you know, attractive uh, uh, as it is, none of this third party voting and, and so on this time around. I was listening to uh, on the radio as I drove up to an interview with the guy who's the um, um, runs the Democratic Party now in Wisconsin, great young organizer for Move On, Ben Wickler. And he was pointing out that in the last election, Wisconsin may be the most important state in the next election. He pointed out in the last election that the Green Party candidate was the margin of difference between Trump and Clinton there. There's a New Yorker threatening to run again on the Green Party ticket this time around. There could be no greater disservice to the all the causes that need to happen than that happening um, um, going forward. So there's going to be some good political arguments going on in the next little while, but it's going to be, I think, really important that we come out strongly unified and ready to fight because, as I said before, uh, I don't think, I mean, the planet can't take another four years of Trump. Um, uh, I don't think our sort of democracy probably will can take another four years of Trump. And I know that my nervous system can't take <laughs> another four years of Trump. I got to say, one of the revelations of the Trump era was that the most underappreciated virtue of all former presidents was that you could forget about them for days or weeks at a time, you know. Um, um, and the fact that we all have to live as adjuncts to this guy's, you know, personality disorder is just too much to ask. 
próxima está mejor. I think we have time for one more. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yep, yep, everybody, I mean, that's one of the things that's going to happen on September 20th uh, uh, at this big climate strike is people are hard at work on college campuses and with high school seniors registering them to vote, um, getting them, and that would be a really good thing for people to be working on here um, in the high schools and colleges of the North Country, which will be back in session by September 20th. Um, um, yeah, I, I will say I think young people are going to vote in very large numbers this time around. They actually did in the midterm elections last time around. And, and so the real, I, I think the deeper problem is going to be that if you go, I mean, and I, I mean, look, I, this is my demographic, and as I look around this room, I see a few other people who are, you know, similarly. Uh, 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 our biggest problem is not young people, it's old people, okay? They vote the wrong way all <laughs> the time. Um, and trying to spread the word that it's not okay to just act out one's own, whatever one's interpretation of one's self-interest is, is got to be one of the messages that older people are sharing with each other, okay? Um, we're the first generations that are going to leave the world a much worse place than we found it, okay? And that's a hell of a, so one way of saying this is everybody insists that they love their children and grandchildren a lot, but I actually, I mean, I, I think that may be more rhetorical than sincere when you look at what people actually do in their lives and with their, um, um, this elections and everything else were in an absolute gut check moment as a civilization. We're really going to know the answer to whether we stood up to the climate question within the lifetimes of almost everybody in this room because the next five, ten years, tell the story. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that if we had any hope of meeting the modest targets we set in Paris, that we had to have cut our fossil, we had to fundamentally transform our use of energy by 2030, cut it fossil energy in half. You all know enough about governments and how they work and things to know that if we're going to do something by 2030, we better have started it by 2020 if we want to have any hope of getting it done. So on every front, local and state and national and global, we've got work to do and the most important part of that work for now is building these movements that put pressure on. The way that movements win is when they change the zeitgeist. It's not when they pass pieces of legislation, it's when they change people's sense of what's normal and natural and obvious and has to happen. And we're right on the edge of that happening. If we can make that happen, if we can take this tough moment that we're in and use it as a way to push on every front, then we've got a real chance. But um, um, that's why, well, that's why it feels urgent to me. And that's why I'm really grateful to be here tonight. And thank you all, the Explorer and the Wild Center and everybody else for, for uh, uh, for this, it's been a great pleasure as always, and and a great um, a great solace as always, just to be in these mountains. It was nice to drive up from the shadow of Crane Mountain this afternoon and cross the Hudson and cross the beautiful Boreas and look north from Newcomb to the high peaks, and 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 uh, we're very 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 lucky. And part of being very, very, very lucky is it puts certain burdens on all of us. Uh, uh, and, and thank you all for taking them up, because I know that many of you have. Thanks. Thank you, Bill.
here. Good to see you. How are you? I was looking for your booth, or when you lost in the market. I think it's